Welcome to Diamond Talk, the Diamond Talk podcast. My name is Marcus Ippolito, and I am the, uh, the owner and CEO of In The Zone Baseball and Softball Academy. Uh, we're based out of North Jersey and Flanders, uh, which is right in Morris County. And I am uh, joined by my co-hosts, which are Coach Taylor Barjaki, who's our general manager here. And he's also the assistant coach over at the College of St. Elizabeth, based out of Morristown. As well as Coach Jeff Falzerano, he's the head varsity coach at Bernard's High School, uh, based out of Bernardsville, New Jersey. And uh, Diamond Talk focuses on the world of baseball and softball, mainly as it relates to players from youth to college. Uh, their parents, their supporters, their family members, as well as the coaches at all the varying levels. So local leagues, club, travel, high school, collegiate, baseball, softball. That's our audience, and we're hoping that you're tuning in today to take a listen to uh, what is the first episode of Many to Come of the Diamond Talk podcast. So today, we're going to be talking about a couple really cool topics. Uh, the first one will be uh, about building a program and setting up a culture, uh, expectations, and uh, creating a competitive atmosphere. We're also going to be touching on uh, finding your team identity and uh, building practice plans that will support it. And our last little segment at the end of the day will be a uh, finishing with some words of wisdom from Coach Jeff Falzerano. So we're going to jump right into it today, and we're going to get into the building a program portion of today's podcast. And this is really where we're focusing on um, the culture and expectations. And, you know, it's January, and uh, parents and coaches everywhere are basically – sitting and thinking about the season, which is jumping up on them fast. They're thinking about how they can be competitive, uh, how they can create a good team culture, and then setting the expectations needed. And uh, Coach Jeff, we're going to start with you. You know, what are your feelings here on this and, you know, some of the things that coaches and parents really need to be aware of? Well, a little of my prep before this was looking up the definition of culture, uh, honestly. Uh, and, I, and, I, you know, the definition loosely defined is uh, norms and behaviors of a society. And in this case, we think of our, our team as our society. Um, I have to tell you that uh, it's something we're always working on. I don't think it's a really easy thing to generate or develop. And when you're dealing with a program that's constantly bringing kids in and out, you know, based on graduation and incoming freshmen, um, you have to figure out a way to, to establish some set of rules or some aspect of commitment. Um, we use something that I refer to as our baseball Bible. It's our Mountaineers attitude. There's a list of things that we go over with our kids and, and, and talk about what we, f we value and importance. Uh, with our program. We also talk about prioritizing. We talk about family, faith, school, and then baseball and tell them if they take care of the first three, the fourth one becomes easier. Mm. Um, but, you know, we're in a sport where everything's measured. Yeah. Uh, uh, statistics are measured, you know, launch angles are measured, velocities measured. Uh, so we have statistics all over the place. Hard to escape it. Yeah, so it, it creates a bit of a slippery slope. Uh, and that slippery slope lends to kids personalizing things, mm -hmm. uh, personalizing their stats, personalizing their play, personalizing um, whatever it is that, that, that we might be doing. And we have to figure out a way to squelch that yeah. so that we can really talk about the team, the team piece and get away from uh, – and, and then recognize the fact that this isn't really about uh, winning baseball games as much as it's about being a part of something and growing and learning and applying things to our lives as we sure. go forward. Yeah. Um, so – we try to talk about that piece a bit. Uh, we try to reinforce that piece a lot. Um, and then from the, from the statistical end, we don't really, I, I don't post batting averages. I don't, uh, I don't focus on those kinds of things. We talk about the quality of bats that a lot of other yeah. people use uh, throughout baseball. Sure. Taylor? Yeah, I mean, Coach Jeff has a great point, and I think that it's a true testament to him because he's had the ability to develop a culture for his program over I mean, how many years have you been over there? The last 17, 17, 18 years. And, you know, it's for, for us over at, co at the College of St. Elizabeth in particular, you know, we're, we're a brand new program. We're developing uh, a, gra a brand new program. So for us, we're trying to set the culture. And for in our case, the consistency is the most important thing, making sure that everything's organized and flows well and, and, and overall makes sense. Uh, but me as a youth coach, from that standpoint, uh, I believe preparing kids for the high school experience because that to them from an early age is their first quote unquote next level. We're mm -hmm. trying to get mm -hmm. them to that next level and that's going to be their first one. Some school, you know, some places will have middle school teams, some places don't, you know, so you can't really apply that. But uh, in that case, you know, our, our job here is to 
create baseball IQ. It's to create work ethics. It's to just build players into being good players, not necessarily to teach every kid how to hit a home run every time or how to yeah. even how to have a quality at bat results based wise, but give them the knowledge to, you know, be able to function that way and do what a coach is asking them to do and see the bigger picture, uh, you know, from that standpoint. Yeah. Um, you know, at the college level, we're showing players life outside of baseball. We're trying to show kids. Uh, and players, you know, what it's going to be like when you have a family, when you have a job, when you have bosses, when you have people that either depend on you or um, vice versa, you depend on, you know, they, they, you yeah. depend on them. You know, and, and you, you've touched on it about, you know, being able to make adjustments. And I think that's pretty much what life is, right, for all of us. Every day we're adjusting to something new, whether, you know, you being a new dad and I have a new puppy in the house, you know, but there's always an adjustment to be made, and I, I can't think of any other more cliche analogy to baseball and any other sport, but if you're able to adjust, you're going to have success, right? So if you guys are teaching them that at the younger levels, it's, it'll always show. Oh, it's, a, it's, it's definitely a huge piece, uh, um, but also just dealing with people mm. <laughs> on an everyday basis and being able to communicate with people. You know, when you're struggling with something, you got to reach out to somebody to get help, right? Yeah. You don't, you don't try to do it all independently. And sometimes you got to find that guy on your team mm. as a player, not as a coach, as a player that's struggling, and go put your arm around him and say, "Hey, we're all good. We got your back. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take care of this next <laughs> kind of thing." Um, but we're, you know, there's, I, I don't feel like I'm an expert. I mean, I'm constantly growing and learning sure. on, on this, and, and and I'm thinking about my culture this year. I'm, I'm, I'm really considering the different things that I'm going to do uh, as far as uh, setting goals and adjusting and getting them to be a little bit more unified. Yeah. Because we, you can't do anything alone right. in any sport. I mean, I'll take that back. You can in, in tennis, but you still, you, you know, if you, you still have a coach that's, that's helping you at yeah. that point. You know, you do, you do in wrestling, but you're still a team game when it comes down to the, you know, so there's a, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot that they can gain. And, and it, what I think happens is we, we everybody looks at us as what what can the sport do for me, mm. and uh, the answer is always where the culture lies. Right. Right. If that answer is get me a scholarship, get me into college, get me to a big school, get, you know those kind, then that's then we're mm. not having a good culture. If the answer is um, teaching me how to work with other people, helping me work hard, teach me discipline. Uh, develop a work ethic, uh, learn how to compete, th that's different. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, one thing that the Division three level, more specifically than some other divisions, is we're constantly stressing the student-athlete part of it, being a student first and an athlete second, because you know there's not a ton of kids that get drafted or the, the, the probability of playing professional baseball in any form or fashion that's from the Division three level is very difficult. Not to say that it can't be done, but it's very difficult. So you need to be able to, like you, like Coach Fowles said, you need to be able to work well with other people, to be able to set goals and, you know, and, and hit those goals. And just the process is just a different process. As a kid growing up, you're trying to, whether it's, you know, have a higher batting average or hit the ball for more power, like that's your goals. But, you know, as a fully functioning adult, your, your goal is, hey, I got to pay my mortgage every month. Mm -hmm. and. I have to do my job correctly. In order to do my job correctly, I have to do X, Y, and Z to get there. So, you know, the, for for me and for the college part of this is life outside of baseball. Sure. It's yeah. teaching these kids life lessons, whether it's something <coughs> as simple as how to use a Google calendar. You know, it's it's something as simple as communicating with with teammates, whether they're teammates, teammates, or they're your you know co your colleagues and coworkers at work that you have to communicate with, and that's your team now. Yeah. There's a reason why businesses are structured around teams, quote unquote. Add time management to that too, right? I mean, and those college yeah. kids really got to figure out time management, mm -hmm. how to go to practice, how to take care of their studies, mm -hmm. how oh, to yeah. take care of their family stuff, how to make sure they eat. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and you know, both of you guys have got obviously you've got the high school level covered here at the table, we've got the college level co covered here at the table, but both of you have done a number of years of coaching at the youth level as well, and I think that the underlying message. From both of you is how do we use baseball as an opportunity to prepare them for what's really next in life and that's life so uh, kudos to both of you for that and uh, you know keep on keeping on um, but it is January not just for all the coaches now that are preparing for the season 
but it's January for all the parents out there that want to help their kids get better. So this is the time of this of our podcast. We're going to talk about some uh, com- quick tips from Diamond Talk. So, uh, you know, it's really important this time of year that parents, you know, work with their kids and on, on their fundamental skills to help them get ready. So we've got a couple really cool quick tips that you can do at home. So these are some at-home drills. Uh, that really don't require much. Uh, they don't require balls flying around, so you don't need a, uh, a batting cage or anything like that to get some things done in the winter. So uh, I'm actually going to start with the first one here, and uh, this is called the head down drill. So, uh, you know, you imagine you're standing in the batter's box, and this is uh, one of these drills that's going to help your player keep their heads down, eye on the ball. It's a pretty simple drill. It's a visualization exercise. So uh, we want to make sure that they're able to track a ball from a pitcher. And uh, just as simply as if you're going to take them out into the yard and throw a ball at them, you're going to be asking them to keep their eyes on the ball. Same thing here. And the way I like to start this one is with uh, a tennis ball or a wiffle ball, and I'll walk the ball in. So I'm walking it through the imaginary strike zone. I've asked my son or daughter to stand in the batter's box and get into their, their hitting position. They don't even need to be holding a bat at this point. And they're just tracking the ball. It's a very simple slow-motion exercise. Um, as kids get older and they're playing high school or college balls, there's, there's things called walkthroughs, which are they go slow motion out on a field, right, and do a walkthrough, which is kind of the same idea just as a hitter at this point. And I really want to just see if their head is turning with the ball. Real slow, real methodical, and then we're going to kind of rinse and repeat at that point. It's probably a little boring, but you know what? It is the type of drill that I call Miyagi-like, right? So everybody remembers the Karate Kid and we remember Wax On and Paint the Fence. Those were boring and laborious, and Ralph Macchio wanted to throw his <laughs> gi in the garbage. Uh, but he kept on doing it, and the next thing you know, he was an absolute karate champion. So uh, we can move this on to throwing a ball. So if you have that kind of area where you can toss the tennis ball or wiffle ball and it just hits you know, a, a, a wall or a door or you're in the garage or what have you, and they can still track that ball behind them, that's how you can continue to extend it. And you can even have them swing um, without the bat, just a, a dry swing. Uh, and then do it with a ghost ball at that point. So uh, there doesn't need to be a ball. They can then visualize the ball coming down the zone with their swing without a bat so that they can create some really good positive muscle memory. So uh, that's my little at-home exercise for all the parents out there that want to do something really quick and easy at home to help their kids prepare for for their next batting practice or when you take them for their lesson or the cage or their team starts working out. So um, Coach Jeff, what do you have for a quick tip today? Well, could add a little bit to what you know, this drill is going to play upon what Marcus just talked about. But in addition to that, I mean, we watch Jeter take pitches, right, and follow mm-hmm. his head all the way through. We try to teach our high school kids a very similar thing, right? When you're taking a pitch, I know where you are, yeah. where your body is by the way you've just, you just took that pitch. If you're on your sure. front foot, and the, and the load stride drill kind of works with that a little bit. So does the pitcher you're facing. So Exactly. Right. The so pitcher, how you take his – if he's a good pitcher – He's going to know what to throw you next. Absolutely. So the load stride drill falls in that same category and can be done in the same fashion that you're talking about. We're talking without a bat, without a ball. But uh, even holding a bat or a PVC pipe to understand a little bit about where your hands are going to be when that front foot strike occurs um, and to make sure you're landing on the outer half of your foot, Hmm. um, making sure that your heel isn't getting closer to your back heel, your front heel is not getting closer to your back heel because if you're you're getting a little front side leakage and then – uh, we could have some issue there. So it's basically just uh, sitting in your stance and uh, visualizing pitch, getting into your load, getting that front foot down, and you can look yourself in the mirror. Mm-hmm. You could uh, do, you know, vi- just use visualization, if visualization of anything, look at your feet, um, and, and make sure your hands are in a good place. Yeah, I agree with the mirror. I think that that's one of those drills that per- <coughs> is built to be done in front of a mirror. Uh, and once a parent or guardian or older brother or older sister helps you understand it better, uh, you can really do that on your own, and, and hopefully you do. You know, those are the kids that go and do those on their own are usually the kids that, uh, you know, are going to turn it into something. So, you know, let's let's move on to um, a little bit more about a lot of, of what coaches are probably thinking about right now. You know, again, being January, where we are in terms of what's coming up for everybody, whether it's an 8U travel team coach or even a D1 program that's out there. Um, everybody's still thinking about this because it's really that important, which is finding your team identity and building practice plans that support it, which is, is an interesting thing. You know, a lot of people just will talk about one or the other, uh, but there's really a, a connection between the two if you're doing it correctly. And, and then obviously if you're not doing it correctly, it could, it could impact. Um, you know, so the wrong type of practice planning could impact your team's identity. So um, 
you know, let's start with with Taylor on this one. You know, teams of all levels obviously need to be de- developing chemistry. So what are some of the simple strategies that pretty much any coach you think can employ to help them understand their makeup and what they can do to help build and encourage the chemistry? Yeah, if, I mean, for me, you know, team makeup is definitely something that coaches need to understand. And that's not just knowing the kids that make up your team in terms of the positions that they play or what their, even what their strengths and weaknesses are. It's, you know, especially for the younger groups, it's, it's learning how to, it's learning how to teach different types of learners. And, you know, Coach Fowles tell, you know, can attest to this, you know, being in a high school setting or just in a school setting every kid learns differently. Some are visual learners, some are hands-on learners. So understanding the makeup of your team, which or how many kids can learn from just watching or just listening to a video or seeing a diagram as opposed to the other ones who are more hands-on who have to be out either on the field or they have to physically draw out the lines or, you know, whatever the case may be. So, you know, that for me is really important when it comes to practice planning because – Either I'm going to do a combination of let's sit down and let's talk about it and let's actually go out and do it either with a ball or without. But, I mean, especially for the younger guys I, with 8, 9, 10-year-olds, they want to be doing something. It's very difficult to keep one of those kids just sitting in a room for 20 minutes while you go over, whether it's bunt defenses or, you know, hey, w- how to cover on a hit to the outfield. Mm-hmm. Uh, these kids want to be doing. So, you know, especially at a young age, you want to get them out on the field, a bunch of kids in a bunch of different positions, positions that they're comfortable with, that they're not comfortable with. Um, And just, you know, very similar to what you were saying earlier with that other quick drill, uh, the quick tip drill about ghost ball. It's a coach standing off to the side yelling go, and everybody runs. You know, the coach is the ball, and he's standing somewhere in the outfield, and everybody has to run to their assigned spot. Mm. You get everybody gets checked. Uh, you did it right. You did it right. You did it wrong. This is where you're supposed to go. Blah blah blah. And then you reset the kids, or you change groups, and they do it again. You know, we in the spring or uh, in the fall, rather, we did something very similar where we practiced running on and off the field and how to warm up properly, mm-hmm. because especially with the younger guys, they might not have ever been taught that. If we have kids that are coming from, you know, rec programs or you know, just for their first time playing at an eight or nine year, you know, you level. You know, we want to encourage them to you know, do the right thing and be moving in the right places. And just it starts with the little things like knowing to run out, you know, where to run out to the position to warm up properly and why that's important. And I think the why is, is sometimes even more important than the, than the how. But, um, yeah, it's just getting them to, you know, it's understanding your team and being able to plan accordingly. Yeah. is the overall message there. Yeah, and, you know, when you have those two different types of learners, I think one of the really important things, too, is that while one may be more the visual learner and one is more the physical learner, they both need to be able to be taught how to learn that way, mm-hmm. right? So, again, it's a life experience. Depending on what the job you're going to get when you're 25 years old, it may be a lot of boardroom staring at something, or you may be a guy sitting in a factory, right, putting together some electronic components. And so being able to teach the kids to be able to sit and watch and learn in in a classroom style of setting and then do like your, you know, the ghost drills or everybody's running out to the field and doing something at the same time collectively, everybody learning at the same time in what's a a higher comfort level for the other players is going to help them bond with one another. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what what it is about that learning for him that helps him and vice versa. All that's that's physical, though, right? I mean, you think about it – the classroom piece, sometimes, you know, it's a separate thing. But as soon as you're on a field, it's mostly physical. Mm. Oh, if yeah. you're spending too much time talking, you lose them. Yeah. yeah. You lose them. They're gone. <laughs> so, but that's why yeah. having a balance, I think, is yeah. the best way because yeah. it accomplishes both goals. It gets the kids moving and doing something and either it's having fun or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but it also teaches them how to learn the other ways being right. able to sit and listen to somebody talk like cause they have to do that in school <laughs> whether they yeah whether they like it or not they have to go so they're going to be still being you know expected to succeed so somebody's just talking at them sure so. and that's one of the things you always talk about the players can bond over is failing together yeah right? that's and the stress point together like the bunch drills and yep. you know they got to get it down in a cer- certain place and if he doesn't do it successfully you know everything resets so all your players all your positions reset but it's 
getting the other kids to start encouraging, motivating that player to get it down mm -hmm. in a positive manner. Right? They learn that positive energy yeah. feeds positive energy, and positive energy feeds positive results at That's that a point. whole other podcast. That's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned earlier, Coach um, Jeff, about you've got a new season, right? And I, I think – Look, you know, it, you hear how many years you've been doing it, but every season's new for you, right? And and there's an excitement to that. You know, that keeps it. Absolutely. That's got to invigorate you and makes you want to come back. But you're bringing in new kids right now to the varsity team, uh, maybe kids that didn't make it last year that are going to make it this year. They're going to be joining kids that are existing varsity players. So you're faced with a similar challenge that everybody else. What are the type of things that you can do or what, are you, what you're using to help your players advance their skills, but also double as team bonding opportunities? I, I do consider this one of my weaknesses. Um, every year it's a challenge to try to figure out how to, how to balance the, the skill piece with the, the team bonding piece. Um, so I, I, I find that I spend a lot of time on the, on the skill piece and um, doing a lot with trying to develop those skills, whether it's individual skills or team skills, whatever it might be. Um, so I'm always trying to force myself to find things to make it more competitive, um, add something competitive to the practice, uh, but I have to remind myself to do so or have one of my assistant coaches remind me to do so because the competitive piece is where the culture really gets developed because that's where you see a little bit of the failure and where they get to support each other through that. That's where you see a little bit of the success, and then they start to gel, and you see which kids are gelling together, which groups are gelling together. Sometimes you're separating them by grade level. Sometimes you're doing a varsity JV. Sometimes you're doing it positionally. But uh, we try to do some things where we are competing. Um, and it, it might be something as simple as we're going to scale this down to 50-foot to base paths with throwdown bases, and we're going to do uh, bunting drills with a defense uh, and the reason I do it shorter is you know it's coming hmm. kids are getting down the line faster you got to make a play we're trying to move advanced guys we're trying to score runs and then they start you know then we have teams that are really getting after each other a little bit <laughs> yeah. uh, and usually I, I'm not a big guy on running we don't really run at the end of practice we do our running and our base running we do our running as uh, certain aspects our, our pitchers add a little bit to their conditioning when they're doing their pens and stuff like that uh, but We'll do it like it'll be cleanup duty, or you got your group's got to bring out the balls every day this week, or that, right. that's our kind of competitive yeah. thing, because uh, high school kids hate bringing things in and out <laughs> for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, so and, and that also adds to your culture a little bit because then it, it, it then there become becomes that idea of uh, the cleanup today is us. We're going to try to do it quickly, and I'm, we've all seen those videos of the college groups that you know want to do it in a minute and a half. They want to yeah. clean everything up. Now I've not I've not quite gotten to that level. Um, <laughs> But whatever we're doing, we're trying to, to kind of build them together to right. have that me, that we is greater than me philosophy. Right. Um, and, and realize that the individual piece contributes to the whole. Sure. Yeah, no, agreed. And, and look, not only are you a, a high school coach of young adults, but you also happen to be a father of a youth baseball player who, um, you know, so you've been around plenty of youth teams. Have you found that it's more or less challenging when kids are younger, you know, in terms, especially when it comes to the identity and, and the practice plans and kind of getting the kids together, you know. So is there something they need to do differently? Is it harder? Is it easier? Um, you know, what if you're a coach of a 10U team? What, what's the position you're in now? I, I think it's more challenging, to be honest. Uh, I, I, do, I do see there are a lot of similarities, um, but there are still some young kids trying to still figure out um, how important the sport is to them, yeah. how good they are at it, if it's really for them, uh, or how good they can be at it. Uh, the mental part of baseball is very difficult. We all know that. Um, and it's tough for professional players, so of course it's uh, going to be tough for a 10-year-old. So we have to do our best to try to make it as much fun as possible. Uh, and it came up before, uh, Taylor had mentioned some aspect of, you know, the, the, the activity and the focus of kids, right? If you have lines of kids working on drills and you don't have enough hands or enough dads to help you figure out a way or you can't figure out a way to station out and make those lines smaller it's not going to be very productive mm. uh, and it's going to be hard to generate any of that that team uh, yeah. concept or, point. or culture yeah. um, and teaching kids to learn how to move past a mistake isn't something that's really easy um, <laughs> per, uh, particularly at 10 so we, we've all we've all seen it 
Um, we've all seen kids who personalize it. We've all seen kids who throw their helmets. We've all seen kids who can't figure out a way to refocus quickly. And I recently heard, I'm trying to remember who I heard state this, that they do whatever they can to teach the guy to process it. And this is on the college level. Process it quickly, you're at bat, and then go support the next guy, you know, pass the baton, right? The idea that, yeah. uh, not, and not an easy thing for us to do. So I think, uh, uh, again, you know, we want energy to be high. We want kids to have fun. We do drills at that level where they're learning a skill, but they're competing, um, not, not riding each other so much, but competing. Um, but I, I, I do feel that it's, it's much more difficult, in my opinion, with mm. the younger kids. Yeah. I, I, listen, I can see it. You know, we've been doing this a long time here at our facility. And, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of kids out there that not only are still, still trying to find their way on the mental side of the game, but on the physical side, too. And sometimes that disruption of that they don't know how to control their own body can lead to a lot of extra stress for them. You know, so anything we can do to help them support them through that and get them to not only find their personal identity, but the team identity, too, too is, is – you know, anything we can do there. And as a club team coach, Taylor, you know, you're a good example of somebody who's worked with kids from 8 to 18. And so you have kids coming from all different towns, you know. So a lot of dynamics we're talking about here have been, um, you know, Bernard's High School. So they're all, a lot of them grew up together and played Little League together in town. And, and you know, your rec level teams, that's the same way. They're at school together. They know each other. <laughs> You're going to get a bunch of kids who don't know anything about each other, and you may not know much about them. So, you know, what's your strategy there? You know, how do you advance? What are you doing that's advancing them and their identity and their their chemistry building? It's a challenge. It's you know? yeah, it's a mix. It, it's a mix of constant movement and constant education, um, and it kind of goes back to you know, you know, finding your team identity and your and your team makeup, and. It's something that, you know, especially at the college level, as you're saying, these, these younger kids, and it, for the younger age groups, it's roughly within the same, you know, 50 miles. Uh, at the college level, you got kids coming in from different states and that they're playing now, their style, it could be a California-style player is now playing with a North Jersey-style player. And everybody in this room knows that, the, you know, there's there's – <laughs> Those kids are completely different from a baseball standpoint and yeah. just from an overall standpoint. So understanding each player's circumstances and just knowing where they're coming from, it, it, it plays a part of that. So having the idea of constant motion and just constant education, um, you know, when, when planning the practice, each segment should just flow right into the next. Mm. If you're working infield plays, you know, a good follow-up segment would be, okay, now we've focused on, you know, everybody going to first or turning double plays. All right, now we're going to kind of slow it down a little bit or just kind of bring it in a little bit more and now focus on bunt defenses. Right. And then as that progresses, all right, now we're going to add all the outfielders are going to now be our runners. And now the outfielders are running while you're doing bunt defenses. So you're getting that in-game type feel where, you know, the kids are starting to feel the runners come in and they're starting to see them to have that, that – internal clock is starting to tick a little bit faster. And then as you sub players out, now you transition right into just team base running at that point. So having a plan that constantly flows to me is very important and is very successful because it just, it keeps their minds on the same topic. Mm. Uh, something, you know, in the total opposite direction would be, you know, going from, all right, we're going to have a, we're going to warm up before practice or as practice is starting and then we're going to have a catch and we're going to work on our footwork and our, our throwing mechanics and then we're going to go with base running. Like mm -hmm. it's, the, it's yeah. the total opposite of what you just worked on. So, you know, why not use that opportunity to build and then kind of like we just talked about, you just mm -hmm. work your way into it yeah. uh, from, you know, a base running, you know, if it's base running or it could be, you know, in, in starting to use your catchers. That's one of the problems that, yeah, you know, especially for youth teams, is getting their catchers involved and getting them educated is because, you know, they also play secondary positions, and it's mm -hmm. very difficult to find a catcher at the ten U level who only wants to be a catcher or wants to mainly focus on catching because mm -hmm. catching is a it's a tough position to play. It's not an easy position physically to play, and it's also a pretty tough position yeah. mentally to play. So that yeah, plays I, a part. Yeah, and you know what, like the the having a a not disjointed practice, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I think has a, a subliminal effect on the kids. They don't recognize it. They don't know what's happening. But that flow and those smooth transitions, it just creates a, a really less stressful environment that they're operating in. You're going to get the best of them. And I just think they're all sort of in the zone at the same time, 
which is just going to help their team chemistry build you mm-hmm. know, over time. And I know you mentioned catchers, and I'm actually going to use that as a little nice segue point to talk about what our feelings are here about some of the managerial changes that are happening out there in the league. One in particular, we've got uh, David Ross, who was a journeyman catcher 14 years, which are sometimes the best catchers, if you ask me. Uh, we know a local catcher at the major league level who I think he's just way too comfortable behind the plate. and It shows halfway through the season every year versus I think a journeyman guy seems to always feel like he's got to work and earn it, right? And I think that mentality is key, right? Mm-hmm. He was a big member of the Cubs with their title in, 20, in their title run with 2016. Both of you guys are catching guys, right? So do you think that the best MLB managers are catchers? Uh, I definitely think that some of the most successful big league managers are catching guys. Definitely some of the longest tenured guys and just some of the people, some of the guys that just almost kind of command respect from their teams and they have this way of just, they just have this way about them. You know, you look at guys like Joe Girardi who for, you know, coached the Yankees for 10 years and in that 10 year span, it was him. uh, it, It was him and two other coaches who had amassed the, the most wins or the best winning percentage in a 10 year span, like in the history of the game. Like it was, it, it's just crazy. Now they might be products of their environment, but you know, there, there's a reason why players want to play for those kinds of guys. Um, you know, Mike Sosha is another great example of a guy who's been coaching in Anaheim just forever. Another uh, catching guy. You know, I think that not only does the position command respect both from a player standpoint, but just from an overall knowledge standpoint, I mean, Literally, you have to be able to handle personalities, you know, especially like you were saying, like a journeyman catcher is kind of the best catcher because he meets so many different pitchers from so many walks of life. And yeah, there's guys constantly coming in, you know, coming in and out of the doors for the New York Yankees and Gary Sanchez. But you know, a guy who's you know who's playing four years with this team and then four years or five years with this team and this team, he develops different types of relationships and he meets different types of players and he meet and he he learns all this different stuff. And I just think that. Being able to manage the personalities of the pitchers, coupled with now he's got to go out there in the middle of a game with all these fans screaming, with all these other teams, and these running, he's got to direct traffic. He's telling them, he's telling the second baseman where he's got to be. He's reminding the pitcher to go back up plays. Like he has to know what's going on at all times. So I think that those guys not only command respect from the game, but they also have this just wealth of knowledge because they see so much of it from behind the plate. Well, I'm a catching guy by default. Um, I was a catcher probably in Little League and then evolved into a center fielder, shortstop, you know, been around a little bit. So not a catcher as a, as a head coach. Um, but by default in realizing that, I felt it as one of my weaknesses that I had to study it and mm-hmm. learn it and, uh, and improve upon it. And then I happened to be fortunate enough to have some pretty good ones play for me. Um, and go on and play at you know Division One level, and then have my son kind of gravitate toward that as well, and watch him develop skills as a catcher that I think are absolutely huge in life <laughs> that I didn't think would come out of him. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you can't predict how your child's gonna gonna turn out, right? You, <laughs> yeah. you try to help, you try to mold, you try to try to guide, uh, but. So I, I so you know one of the things that I think is really huge about it is that leadership piece, that take charge kind of mentality, and then to know which guy you're going to put your arm around and pull with you, mm-hmm. and which guy you're going to stand behind and give a little kick in the tail, mm. um, because yeah, that's huge, particularly on the major league level when they're making more money than you are. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's true. so yeah. You really have to think a little bit about, uh, all right, how am I going to motivate this guy to stay on top of his game? If he's not already self-motivated, yeah. how am I going to get him out of this particular slump? Or, or how am I going to break this to him that he's sitting today? Like, those are, yeah. those are huge things. I mean, we think about it every day as a high school coach or as a, as a youth coach. i got to tell this kid he's sitting for a little bit, or i got to pull him because his attitude is pretty bad. But, um, and how's he going to take it? How's he going to respond? They're thinking the same thing with guys that are making millions of dollars. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 there's, a, there's a great uh, quality about them in the way, yeah. when they're good at it, sure. about the way they handle their pitching staffs, about the way they lead their teams. They yeah. have to be. If they're not good leaders, 
they're, they're not never going to make them. They're never going to make it. And you know, those are some very wise words from Coach <laughs> Fowles, which is uh, <laughs> well, our, our segue into the final piece for today, which is words of wisdom <clears throat> with Coach Fowles. So, uh, you know, you're going to give us some nuggets right now, and um, very specifically on how to be a successful high school athlete. So re- regardless of the sport, too. So this is an agnostic set of nuggets we're going to get from you. <laughs> and anybody that wants to have some success at the high school level, uh, look, this is a man with a, with a, a long enough tenure here that um, there's definitely going to be some good stuff for you to listen in on. Well, I don't think anything I'm going to give you is really revealing today. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it came up a little bit before in the idea of what is the sport going to do for you. Uh, and anytime you're talking about a sport, what we're looking for are disciplined, hardworking, focused kids that are also very humble. Um, you know, they're respectful to the sport. They're respectful to their teammates. Um, they're respectful to their opponents. Uh, I think those are huge qualities uh, that we can bring forward. Um, they have to be able to listen, learn to look somebody in the eye, shake somebody's hand. Um, and then the mental toughness piece, I mean, you know, mindfulness is a huge piece of our world today in everything that we do. Um, learning how to be where your feet are, be present in that moment. And it goes back to what I said earlier today about the idea if you take care of your family, your faith, your schoolwork, then there shouldn't be anything that we need to worry about when you're here on the field with me. You're where your feet are. Yeah. You can get back to your academics later. Right? When you have your homework or what you have to do, you can take care of your chores for your folks. Right, You can take care of your religion, your faith. Like You can take care of all that stuff. So, um, And by the way, those disciplined skills are what every college coach is looking for. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, definitely. Yeah, and, and you know, I think we, we definitely had a theme to this, to this podcast, without a doubt. And it was certainly what's probably become very cliche. I mentioned it earlier about how what we do with sports – what we learn on the field, what we learn at practices, what we learn it from very good coaches, what that's going to do for us as players as we move on to our, our, our regular life, if you will, after it's all said and done, whenever the last pitch is thrown or the last football is caught or whatever sport that you're involved with, there's going to be a last day for that. And if you're able to gain something from your experience at the youth level, the high school level, and if you're lucky enough, the college level, then that means you had some really good coaches along the way. And uh, two of them are sitting with here with us today, so we're really thankful to have them as co-hosts on Diamond Talk and, and Coach Taylor Barjaki and Coach Jeff Fazerano, who will join us in many episodes to come. Well, that's going to wrap up today's episode of Diamond Talk, and if you have any questions or comments on today's topics, or if you have any questions you'd like answered in an upcoming episode, please email us at diamondtalkshow at gmail.com. That's diamondtalkshow at gmail.com. And uh, in our next episode, we're going to be featuring a review of Do You Hit, which is a um, virtual strike recognition uh, training tool. Uh, We're going to have some amazing Diamond Talk quick tips for parents and players. And then we're also going to be talking about, uh, and this is actually a big topic, uh, being a successful multi-sport player in uh, what is becoming a quote-unquote single sport environment. So uh, we really look forward to... uh, Having you tune into the next show, and we'll see you on the diamond.